All right. What about uh, the next section here? It says uh, God who makes himself known. So this is kind of the, you know, argumentation for the existence of God kind of idea here. And so they tell us that many apologists, uh, for many apologists, the dominant question in apologetics is how one should seek to persuade non-Christians to believe in God. Uh, and it's here they tell us that the four approaches often seem furthest apart, but they think that, uh, you know, this is needlessly so. <laughs> so, for instance, classical and evidentialist apologists uh, generally favor deductive and inductive proofs for God's existence, while Reformed apologists and fetus generally reject such proofs. So, you know, given that, it would seem that they are, you know, hopelessly for far apart from each other. <laughs> but they tell us, however, that their place, the, the place of at least the latter two, the uh, Reformed and the fetus, uh, they use arguments, but they're indirect arguments for the existence of God. Mm -hmm. So they don't necessarily give up arguments, right, is what they, they're pointing out. Right. <clears throat> so they go on to say that there's no reason why these arguments might not be useful either together or separately in different contexts. And that was a big thing that they um, promoted with their perspectival uh, approach uh, as, as kind of um, uh, uh, popularized by John Frame and they uh, – Really like that uh, aspect to it uh, for their for their for their approach, uh, a, a, a meta approach, if you will. But uh, fetus and reform apologists usually criticize the classical and evidential arguments because they cannot prove God. All that it can prove is an infinite ground <clears throat> of being or a finite designer or designers. But in any case, the apologist need not and usually does not claim that any one of these arguments or even all such traditional arguments combined proves everything that needs to be known about God. Right. So so notice if you say, here's an argument for God and the reformed or the fetus says, well, wait a minute, that, you know, it only shows, you know, a certain perspective on God or, you know, that God is infinite or that something, he's the unmoved mover, but that's not, you know, telling us very much about God. Well, the, the point they're trying to make here is no argument, right, proves everything about God, Right. And so, you know, you don't need to give up an argument just because it doesn't prove everything. Right. <laughs> right. To, to, to use the verse uh, that God is love, uh, that we, we all enjoy or either cringe at, depending on who's uh, wielding that verse. Uh, if someone were to say, oh, is, is that all God is? Well, no, that's like <laughs> towards the middle of the end of the book. And, and, uh, and we get it throughout as well. But here's, here's the explicit uh, of, of, uh, equalization of, of the two. And so, uh, no, uh, there's a lot of pages that come before this. There's a lot of uh, stuff that's known. And so we don't just throw out, well, I guess God isn't love. Uh, like, no, <laughs> talk, talk, talks yeah. about this, this, this uh, uh, integrative approach of, of all these different aspects of God who has revealed himself in history and in different ways and different forms and uh, carries uh, himself out uh, as, as a, uh, uh, not just a mathematical equation, but as, as, a, <laughs> as a mind, as a, as a being. Exactly. And so then what's the purpose of theistic mm. proofs, right? Well, they say it's a more modest purpose. <laughs> uh, it, it's to basically to establish the reasonableness of belief in the kind of God spoken of in Scripture, so that the non-Christian will be convinced to take the miraculous and revelatory claims of the Bible more seriously. So it's a modest kind of thing. You don't try to, you know, every proof isn't it, the whole, you know, shebang, we might say, right? Which is one it's, of the things that John Frame talked about when uh, he kind of critiqued the uh, presuppositional uh, or the, the, the Vantillian presuppositional model uh, in his book that we read. Yeah. And so... Um, you know, the idea here, and it's clear that uh, no argument can produce faith, right? Only God can do that. And so this is just as true of the transcendental argument for Cornelius Van Til as it is for the design argument for William Taylor, or the cosmological argument of Noam Geisler. Uh, even arguments that formally produce absolutely or deductively certain conclusions, notice, do not create or constitute faith. <laughs> Right. So different arguments can be useful, they tell us. And this is the point in persuading people to come to faith in God. You can use different arguments to get people there. Right. Which I think a lot of times what we see when we uh, see the YouTube debate clubs uh, doing these things is 
the persuasiveness of arguments are, are, are what people are looking for. I think uh, that shows probably the, the misnomer of what we believe debates to do, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, but the, that persuasion factor seems to be the the the, the one. If, if you're writing a movie, that that's the one where you know the 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 hero has has uh, gone through his hero's journey, and he comes to the final debate pros, and he he presents the the argument that is unable to be matched or beaten, and just the opponent sits down in utter shock, and and he he can here I stand, I can do n nothing else because the argument has been made, and we all see it, and everyone applauds at the end. And so I think that's what we're all kind of wanting to hope for, but I think that's more the, the movie version of things and, uh, and <laughs> not so much uh, what, uh, what we should be looking for. And again, uh, I'll, I'll harken back to um, uh, the story that Lee Strobel presents in uh, uh, Case for Christ. You know, he's doing this uh, investigation and it's not just talking to these people, it's uh, seeing his wife change and interact with uh, the Christian community and how um, uh, he doesn't get to the end of the book and suddenly faith is produced when, when all the puzzle pieces come together. He kind of gets there three quarters of the way through the book and you're like, whoa, hold on. You know, th this isn't what's supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is that that final piece is unlocked and it, it, it clicks your mind into place. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, you're down on your knees and, and having, having the, uh, uh, I can only imagine song play in the background and, and all those things, <laughs> but th that's, that's not what we, that's not what we should expect. That's not what we see. And uh, a lot of times, even in scripture, uh, the, the faith produced is, is not at the end of the story uh, for, for uh, God's story here. Yeah. yeah.